Welcome to the Blue Security Podcast, a weekly podcast for information security defenders, where we bring you discussions on best practices, tools, and implementation for enterprise security. Now, here are your hosts for today's show, Andy Ja and Adam Brewer. Welcome to another episode of the Blue Security Podcast. I'm Andy, your host. I'm Adam, your co-host. We have a fun show lined up for you today. We have two guests on who were former guests, Nate Gardner and Gavin Ashton. And we're going to do something that we always talk about that organizations should do, which is tabletop exercises. And so we're going to go back and forth, have some scenarios, and talk about what we think we should do. And it's fun for defenders to listen in on other people's perspectives and different experiences. So, Nate, if you can give a quick intro and then Gavin, another intro on your experience in this area and, um, you know, what you uh, hope to have today. Sure. Hello, everyone. Uh, Nate Gardner, currently um, an information security manager at Exact Sciences, 25 years of information technology experience, specialized in information security over the last 10 years. Cool. Uh, I'm Gavin Ashton. I'm currently a, a cybersecurity um, architect at Microsoft. Um, my experience is 20 odd years in Microsoft identity and security from in house consulting roles, and I've just joined Microsoft in the last year. Awesome. So let's get into it, guys. We have a couple of scenarios lined up, and we'll see you know, what you guys would do in an incident response situation. So this is an easy one. It happens often, and it's often debated in companies what people should do. A system admin with domain admin permissions has given notice, and they have unique knowledge to the organization. They can't be replaced immediately, and resources don't allow you to assign them a shadow. How do you handle their last two weeks at the org? And I'll I'll preface that with saying... <laughs> Are we even going to give them two weeks at the org? Because sometimes the answer is to walk them out the door right away when they give their notice. That's often a thought process that goes through managers' minds when they have that level of permission. So, Nate, I know you've been through this before, so I'm going to give this one to Gavin and see what he says. Okay. So um, I think there's some interesting what you're saying about being walked out the door there, because I think there's some regional differences. So in, in the UK, and I'm, I'm going to see the rest of Europe, um, it's much more traditional for people to work a notice period of like a month to a, a couple of months. Um, and unless it's an obvious insider risk scenario, people will generally work through that. Um, uh, also, I guess it might um, be um, influenced by the amount of individuals or the level of the individual within the organization. So if it's... Um, you know, a squad of 20 operational people who might have that level of access, maybe it's easier to, to cut off their, their access sooner. Um, if it's a, you know, more managerial level and it's, you know, like you said, there's not um, a clear replacement, maybe immediately, maybe they'd, 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 they'd keep that access before. But if, if it's a, if it's a case where, you know, there's a, there's a clear insider risk issue here, then that would be, you know, people would be pulling the plug pretty quick. Makes sense. Nate, what are your thoughts on this? Yeah, I, yeah, I'm with Gavin on this one. Yeah, not walking him out the door, you know, unless they present an active risk, right? Have they said bad things? Have they had, have they been, you know, doing things around the organization that would believe you, you know, that they were trying to do something malicious? Otherwise, you know, you really need to get a brain dump from them, right? You don't have a ton of time, so get a brain dump. But the biggest thing I think that people tend to forget about is most daily items that should be part of a playbook, run book you know, hit by the bus scenario type of thing, right? So anybody could pick up day-to-day -day stuff. It's the once in a while items that the person may do. You know, like, oh, I help this team renew certificates on this system. And they do it once a year. And they're not, you know, that's the stuff that you really need to get out of this individual and document. And it really can open up a lot of opportunities. Oh, this is what you were doing? Well, we shouldn't be doing that. Let's set this up for automation or have a different process for it. So it's not all bad. And yes, I've been through it not once, not twice, but three times within a very short period of time. So well-versed. <laughs> that, um, that point about the operational thing is you've got to sort of hand over. 
um, something that I did, I didn't really see happening or being mentioned until fairly recently is when that individual has left. Oh no, it's all going spotty for me. So I don't know if you can hear me or not. <laughs> we got you. Yeah. Yeah. You can. Um, is is that point about you know what 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 accounts did this person have access to? You know what credentials do we need to go around and, and start resetting now? You know that 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 control pane level of access. You need to make sure that you've got that that covered from a. You know, is that person going to come back around and and you know present some sort of risk? Um, so yeah, it's that ongoing uh, operational um, tidying up that level of access, and also. I've seen where um, maybe you do some sort of sanity checking, you know, go back to your audit data and just sort of eyeball, you know, the last couple of days or a couple of weeks of activity just to make sure that, yeah, nothing too untoward. Very good. Yeah, I, I have pretty much the same same thought process as you guys. Um, it really depends on how long they've been there as well as you know their demeanor as they were there if they presented themselves as an insider risk i think it warrants a conversation for sure anytime a domain admin leaves and has that level of access just to have a sanity check with the rest of your teammates who are staying you know what do you think of keeping his access for the next two weeks you know something like that and if there's any doubt among the team then you know you can have a discussion about it but um yeah, default behavior, as long as they don't present an insider risk, keep their access. Yeah, so if Nate's going to leave, then, yeah, we're cool with Nate. Nate's, Nate's a nice guy, you know. But if Andy's going to leave, uh, well. <laughs> 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 exactly. Well, I've been on the other side of this, too, where I was the person leaving um, through through a set of circumstances which, you know, are completely irrelevant to the show, Uh Myself and one other gentleman who were the two global administrators for our Office 365 environment both left the organization at the same time. And it was not intentional or to be malicious. It's just the way stuff works out sometimes. And, you know, again, extremely high level of access to some of the most mission critical systems, not necessarily domain admin, but global admin is pretty darn close too, as far as keys to the kingdom. And, you know, obviously we, we showed a very good demeanor. We wanted to be part of the solution. We wanted to help offload as much of that as possible, but it does highlight really something Nate said that the more you can operationalize and get those into run books and playbooks, the better off you are because we are still kind of running this, like we knew what to do day to day, but it would be really hard for somebody else to step in and handle that. And uh, I, I think that was lessons learned for us as far as how we can do transitions better in the future at, at next stops along the way, but also for that organization. So I think from the risk perspective, it's it's very much a human decision. And I, I like pulling in some of the colleagues to help vet that decision making. Should we continue to allow this person to have access or should we walk them out? And then um, just you know, one other piece to add in here, not that it's always about tools, but there are insider risk tools today, insider risk management tools that can tie into HR systems and that when that signal comes through that an employee is given notice to leave, it can start doing additional scrutiny of not only their behavior for the last two weeks, but also going back a period of time like 30, 60, 90 days to see if they'd been kind of secretly offloading a whole bunch of information, dumping a bunch of stuff on a flash drive, leaking information to third party clouds, whatever the case may be. So. That's also, if this is a concern or something you've gone through, there is tooling available today to help you with that process to make sure there is an additional risk or additional malicious activities that have occurred along the way. Awesome. Good discussion here. So the next one here I have is your organization's data has been discovered on a publicly available website. It was reported privately to an employee. However, they didn't notify org leadership for weeks the leak data hasn't made the news cycle yet, but it certainly will. How do you handle this? And we'll start with Nate. You know, for me, it completely depends on what type of data this is, right? I'm in a highly regu regulated industry. Um, there's communication rules depending on what type of data. So the first call is to legal, or well, you know, your privacy teams, et cetera, to say, hey, do we need to put this information under priv privilege? If we do, we need to handle it differently, right? Because there are precedents out there where, depending on how, you know, how the breach happened, what type of data it is, that information can be used against the organization 
in follow-up lawsuits, right? So you want to make sure you do the right thing. Because if you go ahead and bring in like your forensics teams, incident response teams, get things going, they gather all of this data. Again, depending on what type it is, it could be used against you. You know, the courts could use that data. But once you put it under privilege, then it's in a different realm. Um, but again, you know, that's going to affect your communication levels. You know, do you have to notify certain organizations? Do you have to notify users? Um, so, you know, there's different pieces to this, right? You'd go through your, your standard incident response plan as well, as far as, okay, where did the data come from? How did they get in? Do we need to do this? There's, there's a lot of different pieces to it. But I think the number one part is protecting the organization's brand and, 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 and the users whose data was probably, you know, exfiltrated. Gavin, your thoughts? Yeah. Um, so my, my mind is sort of going straight to sort of GDPR and, and the, the legal requirements to notify bodies that, you know, you've had a breach and that their data data has been leaked. And, you know, like Nate, Nate said, depending on the nature of the data will impact how you, how you go about that. Um, cause that, that can lead, that can lead to as much trouble as, you know, the actual data itself, you know, in a, in a breach scenario, um, in terms of, um, the communications i've also seen cases where you know people who manage certain platforms may feel that well this isn't a major significant thing then maybe i don't need to notify people you know the, the first thing you know in microsoft we have our own teams that deal with this sort of thing um and it's the first time i've ever come across an organization where you know there's such a clear path you know just go notify these folks you know that that sort of legal framework and that that openness with the legal team um really helps um yeah, and then as Nate said, you know, there's the whole sort of back, at, you know, the, the 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 finding how that data was exfiltrated, you know, and depending on what that data is, you know, maybe maybe it's a certain piece of IP, maybe it is private data. If it's if it's that critical, then you know, you're going to have eyes on, on on how it got out there. Um, part of the issue that you find with that is most often, well, many times you just don't have the logging, you know, or there just isn't the the data there to support that investigation. So as with anything to do with security, you know, having that data is a good thing. So whether that's, you know, log analytics or M365 data, what have you, you know, get that logging on. Yeah, it's interesting because when you're talking through this, I always think information security has different little overlaps and facets with compliance and even HR in some, in some aspects and nowhere in the response was um was it mentioned of what you might do with the employee so i think if no one w were to do anything at least have a conversation with the employee on what you should you know if something is reported like this to you how it should be reported to information security so not necessarily disciplining the employee, but at least having a conversation and saying, hey, just a little bit of education. If something like this happens, at least report it to information security so we can start taking action on it. I, I thought that's what kind of stood out from Gavin's response is talking about internal to Microsoft. And it, it immediately in my head, and this is a little bit of inside baseball, but two things immediately jumped out to me, aka.ms slash report it now. I know the URL to report it off the top of my head because it gets beaten into us or microsoftintegrity.com from the standards of business conduct. So from a when when we read through this scenario and we determine like, OK, what what did we do wrong? Like, what's the behavior we need to correct? I think the biggest correction is the employee didn't provide notification in timely fashion. Right. Obviously, the goal is to have never have data leakage. That's probably not a a achievable goal, like never 0% is not achievable, although it's something we're always going to work toward. But what we can work toward, what we can achieve is near 100% compliance with reporting in a timely fashion. That's a, that's a solvable element where we can educate our people and we can make them aware. And so I like that call out in particular. I think it's interesting that overall, this really is a compliance driven, legal driven conversation where our privacy officers, compliance officers, legal officers, they're really going to dictate the path forward. In all honesty, you probably shouldn't start any remediation efforts, any pulling logs, any anything until they've been notified and they're kind of charting that path forward. Because to Nate's point, there is liability concerns with that. 
on how you manage those communications, those efforts, those everything. And so you really want that to be guided by the people whose job it is to know the best way to handle that. And so I think from an infosec perspective, you know, notify the right people and then follow the guidance that's provided is, is really the path forward. And one more thing I'll add in general with these, you know, we've talked about it on our show before, but having some sort of incident response playbook, like Nate would say, so that you can pull it off the shelf and know who are these people to contact. Because when we say contact legal or contact HR or contact compliance, like you should have somewhere written down, like this is the privacy officer. This is the person who's in charge of compliance. This is the HR person we need to contact. This is our legal representative. And in an incident like this, org data getting leaked, these are the folks that you need to rope in into the communication right away so that you're not scrambling to even figure out who those people are. You can just look up the document. Um, back in the day in the military, we'd say pull that binder off of the shelf and start flipping to the pages and having a checklist of people so that you can just send out the communication right away. There's, a, there's another point there around um, how we um, communicate with each other as an organization uh, when that doesn't exist. Like if you don't have that in place, you're going to get you know, heated discussions. It's going to be easier to sort of think about repercussions or blame or you know what have you. If you don't have that plan in place, you don't have that clarity and people can't be expected to get it right first time every time. Um, you know, so being being clear with people about what's expected, and also not um, using this as a you know, my mind is going to sort of fishing training type scenarios where people are being you know um, hammered if they if they do click on the link rather than educated. We're using it as a thing to you know as a stick to beat people with. You know, this is pe people want to do the right thing, and you've got to give them the tools to do the right thing. Right, and and real quick, just to tag on that, Andy, is it's great to have a plan but make sure you run through that plan on a whatever basis it is. Once a year, it's like backups, right? If you don't do a restore, you don't know. Um, same thing there. You don't want to have the heated discussions when an incident's actually occurring. Try to run through it beforehand. So. It's interesting also, I um, I know Gavin has maybe even been through this in, in person, but the communication plan should include multiple ways of contacting those people. If you just have email, like what happens if your email goes out, right? You should have a phone number and maybe even a backup, you know, to that or something, you know, like, um, like signal app or WhatsApp. I mean, I know that in incident response situations, when everything goes haywire, people just find whatever way to communicate with each other. But if you have that thought process ahead of time, like, Hey, my, corporate email may be compromised. Here's my personal email. Here's my phone number. Here's my home phone number. If people still have those, you know, so, um, that's, that's a thought that just popped into my head too. All right. Our next one, an employee has increasingly become adversarial and has threatened a lawsuit against the organization retaining counsel. When do you pull access from an adversarial employee? And I did follow one, person who was on Twitter who actually had a lawsuit against Apple and it was interesting to see her tweets and some of the news that was surrounding it. So this is something that does happen, um, labor practices or some sort of um, sexual harassment or something like that, right? Like it could turn into counsel and the lawyers for the organization, just remember, anyone who's in an organization, the lawyers are not there to protect the employees. They're there to protect the organization. So they're not going to help any employee who retains any type of counsel. So Nate, we'll start with you on this one. Yeah. Again, HR and legal are going to drive this, right? They might come to the information security team. Hey, what, you know, what capabilities do you have? This person has made these comments. They have, you know, tweeted, done this. What can you do? Well, you know, let them know and, and maybe put on, you know, certain tracking, you know, pieces, make sure we save all their email, put, you know, legal hold in place, um, you know, whatever other tools that you have in place. But otherwise, we're not going to make any movements with regard to access or anything until HR gives a go, because doing that could cause a whole nother, right, set of issues. And then everything just starts avalanching and you're, 
be going down. So definitely HR is driving that conversation along with legal. Gavin. Yeah, I, as, um, my, my mind is going back to my days of being a MIM consultant and <laughs> all the hooks you build into sort of HR backend systems for like an emergency uh, exit scenario, right? So um, typically your processes would sort of allow for, you know, graceful exit processes where, you know, there's a planned end date and whatnot. In this scenario, it's useful to have that sort of get them out now kind of backup process. So if you have to eject somebody, you know, at a moment's notice, you know, like Nate said, you know, you, you don't do that unilaterally. You wait for that instruction to come from, you know, a legal or an HR. But um, what you can often find, and it's similar to the last case where if you don't have a process for it, you run around like headless chicken in, in every scenario. And, and maybe you, you do all the right things or maybe you don't. So you think about, okay, how are we going to disable access? How are we going to remove tokens? How do we you know, lock access down, maybe use conditional access controls or something. You know, there's, there's all these different things that you can do to support um, to, to support the organization. But it's in a, as a response. It's not a, I will go do, you know, unilaterally. Yeah, I, again, I think in large organizations with a fleshed out HR and legal policy, this is a, a no brainer, right? You, you wait for them to give you the go. I think in smaller organizations, um, you know, maybe HR is not as versed in something like this or legal is not as versed, or maybe you don't have legal representation for the company. This is where, again, I see that blend of information security over legal with HR. And it's not surprising that there are actually, you know, people with JDs who are in information security. There are people who are former law enforcement who are former investigators who are in information security. So there are people with that type of knowledge and experience that maybe you lean on them if you don't have a legal department or you don't have an HR department. But uh, yeah, uh, if you do, I'd agree with Nate and just, you know, you wait for them because you could cause another HR incident by cutting off their access. And then there, that may provoke even more legal action against the company. I think the one interesting part of this conversation though, and maybe what had been meant this conversation to generate based on the topic was that kind of fuzzy line between information security has this responsibility to protect the company's assets information. And generally there's a lot of unilateral decision-making over there is a risk here because this account might be compromised or the device might be compromised and we're going to temporarily block access until we kind of get that sorted. And I think what this is really getting at is, okay, this might be less of a clear compromise where it's, it's a different actor or, or a compromised endpoint, but there is still kind of a compromised individual accessing things. And I think that's where the line gets a little blurry and, I, and not to say I disagree with what everyone said, because I would follow the exact same practice of, again, leaning on legal HR. However, I think it's just an interesting discussion point in that sometimes InfoSec has unilateral decision-making and sometimes they don't. And where that line is, is almost a little blurry in a scenario like this one where, hey, we this, this, this person has said or done some really sketchy things and we might not want them to have access to stuff right now. But we don't feel we have the unilateral decision-making in this case. And so that's, I think, what makes it interesting and challenging to navigate. And in general, when in doubt, you know, lean on some of those other departments to help make that decision. You know, a lot of organizations move to that model where if we have decentralized decision-making and we've brought a lot of stakeholders together, then no single person can be responsible. And uh, I don't always like that model of decision making, but I think in cases like this, it does make a lot of sense, right? You don't want to be the sole person who can fall on the sword for something like this. I, I don't want to use it as a, you know, uh, <laughs> I'm conscious that there's three Microsofties on the call, but, um, you know, there's other controls out there that can help you. I'm thinking about like DLP controls where you say, okay, if this, if this is an insider risk scenario, and yes, do, do you start to go around like deleting sensitive data or whatever? you know, you can pick up on that kind of activity um, again through the insider risk controls. Um, and that's where I'd be leaning on more kind of audit and visibility type capabilities rather than just straight up, you know, go out and, you know, block somebody straight away. Might not be a bad idea. Like you said to, I, I forget if I think it was Nate, maybe it was you Gavin, but said, start retaining everything, you know, up your audit logging level, maybe to put them in the highest tier of audit logging. So you have the greatest amount of visibility if it comes to that, right? And 
those are things that you could probably make those decisions pretty unilaterally in that as someone has been identified as more high risk, we want uh, a larger audit trail of activity. Yeah. So this next one's fun too, because I've had to deal with it in an actual incident. The employee that is managing your social media accounts has decided to exit the organization in style, or you can think of it like if your social media accounts were compromised. Um, A lot of times people who are, in smaller organizations, they don't have the money to get a social media platform to manage all of their credentials. And so what happens is they give direct access and direct login to the social media accounts. In the case of, say, Twitter, you only have one login. And if you provide access to that login, oh, and by the way, MFA is you know, defaulted to a phone number. And so that social media manager puts in their personal phone number to get the MFA token and they leave. And now your MFA is tied to that account. That happens a lot. Um, Or they don't turn on MFA at all. And it's a weak password, which can be compromised. And that's happened before as well. Um, In the case of like Facebook, you actually give access to a company page on their personal Facebook account, which is, I think is crazy. So, this is definitely a scenario that has happened. Um, you know, some rogue post or some employee uh, who has left and they're they're mad and they post something um, or they refuse to give you the token. So, how do you think you would handle that, Gavin? There's a mischievous side of me that really enjoys those posts when they happen. But <laughs> hey, that's, 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 that's an aside. Um, but yeah, there's there's really sort of two issues there, isn't there? There's one is the strength of the account and just the likelihood of the account being compromised in the first place. And then there's the what do you do when the when it's an insider risk, you know, scenario. So of course the first point is if you haven't got MFA enabled on those accounts, why haven't you? Because you can do that across all the social platforms now. That's easy. Some of the support, um, you know, Fido two keys or what have you. You know, I guess that's going to depend upon the organisation that's running that account. But uh, it's easy to make an account secure in the first place. If you have that social media manager or individual with those credentials posting that stuff, you know, the the, the key here is you, you're going to have backup code. So let's assume that you have a deployed MFA. When you do that, you invariably get that that capability of downloading that that set of backup codes. Um, so if that account starts to, you know, whoever's spouting out those posts that you don't want to have appearing, you know, you, you can have that backup code go in there, start resetting the account, and tie the credentials back to another phone or another device. Um, so that's simply about regaining control. Um, in terms of, you know, what they're posting and what the, you know, what the what what if that's sensitive material or you know inflammatory material whatever what have you you know that's again it's going to be on your legal teams to sort of manage what that looks like you know who knows what what they're posting but there's ways of regaining access to the to the account nate your thoughts yeah andy you bring up a great point about you know big companies have this right like my organization a little more mature we have you know different ways to get the you know to have the backups and whatnot small organization may not um, at that case, you're at the mercy of that social media platform to get that brand back. I can say I've worked not on social media platforms, but other platforms trying to get information and they will not work with you certain times. Mm. They'll be like, hey, that's sorry, so sad, but that's not uh, not what we're going to do. Now with Twitter and Facebook, some of the bigger ones, yeah, there's probably you know there's ways to prove your identity that you own it and you can get that back. But a lot of times you know, they're not going to have the backup codes. They're not going to know whatever the questions were that the person put in or, or whatever. So you're going to have to, you know, go back to the, you know, to that social media company and try to prove your brand. And then of course, work the legal route with your legal and HR teams (laughs) on the, uh, the person that made those tweets. Yeah. I I think you're, you're spot on here. Um, This is more of a, to do for defenders. But one of the things that Adam and I had talked about before is a password manager and modern password managers like LastPass and one password and Bitwarden have the ability to store the MFA QR code within the manager itself. So you're not tying it to um, someone's physical phone or a phone number. And that is often a, 
a best practice, even though you're putting the password and the MFA one-time passcode in the same spot on a shared account like that, that's probably the best way. And most organizations limit who can natively sign into those social media apps. If you haven't used some sort of platform like Sprout or eClincher, there's a bunch of them out there that you can link up different social media accounts to and then provide role based access to those accounts to say this person is a poster only or you could say you have to have a person review before it can get posted and so those are best practices in larger organizations um, for sure even uh, an organization that i am a part of that's a volunteer organization we purchased a a license to uh, a social media managing platform so that we don't have everyone just posting whatever I think the bigger takeaway here, you know, forget the social media for a second, Gavin, Nate, both touched on this, is really, and I don't want to act like this is a coming apocalypse or use really, you know, crazy words like that, but small and medium business, just a growing risk in so many different information security practices because they just don't have the tools, they don't have the investment. The leaders of those companies usually don't understand why they would need to make that investment. It would be a huge portion of their headcount or their expenses to bring those people on. And they see them, you know, as an expense, like a janitor at some of those smaller orgs too. They don't see them as like bringing value. And it's just a, um, with how complex a lot of this is and how many tools you need to do it the right way. So many of them are just like doing it good enough, you know, and, and, Good enough is fine until you hit the skids and something like this, and then you're in trouble. And I just see that as a growing area of opportunity for information security to vendors and information security vendors um, to figure out ways to deliver tools that are you know, simple enough to deploy and use without a ton of enterprise level care and feeding that can help secure them. Because I see that as really a huge amount of attack surface across so many different scenarios at small and medium business. And this is a great example of something like that, where there's the right way to do it, where you can eliminate almost all of the risk. But if you haven't done that, then you're in a world of hurt. And now you're also dependent, to Nate's point, on these social media companies who are not exactly known for their award-winning customer service, you know, because ultimately you're kind of not their customer. The people who are buying ads are their customer. You know, Facebook's customers are advertisers, not your little company that wants to have a Facebook page, you know, your restaurant or whatever. So there's a interesting uh, i was thinking as you were talking there uh, i was thinking about folks i know in in this scenario and yeah you know they they're, they're using things like personal devices and you know little to no mfa and they're probably not using password managers and you know all the things that make people you know folks like us go oh no you know um but again like what, what's the risk what's the risk so thinking of like a major brand, like they're going to be clear targets for, you know, compromise. Or if I'm going to make a point about the organization I'm leaving, you know, if it's a big, you know, visible account, then that's going to have an impact. You know, if I if I manage a Twitter account for a local mom and pop shop, uh, you know, it's going to be awkward for that for that, for that um, business. But um, yeah, the, the, it's, a, it's a different scale of impact. Um, but still, you know, you don't want to lose that Twitter account. Um, so it's just, how do you, it's about visibility, like any of these things And this, it's, if you don't have the people, um, it's up to folks like us to sort of keep shouting from the rooftops, like, please do this, please do this, please do this. And every now and then, you know, it sinks in, but you've got to take the, uh, take the wins where we can. Okay. So this next one is fun and has also happened in our world. An adversary has asked an employee in your customer service organization to install remote access software and they are compensated afterwards. So in this case, they went ahead and installed it and then the adversary paid them to do it. And we'll say for the case of the tabletop, you have discovered rogue r- remote access software like uh, log me in and you're not a log me in uh, customer. So you're doing a, a review of the software and you find this rogue software on one of your customer service um, organization's uh, computers. We'll start with Nate on this one. What do you think? Uh, I'm going to go right to my in-service response playbook, right? Because that's really what this is. This is, hey, let's 
let's work this like you know an outsider installed you know a rat on the machines or whatever you got to go through the whole process okay where is it at what type of data may have been exfiltrated but then also contact your legal teams to have to deal with that and hey do you bring in the fbi do you bring in the external law enforcement at that point because if it is um let's say nation state type stuff right like it's china or russia or something like that or another company or even if it's a company you know that happened with coke and pepsi right <laughs> they they called in the um the admin staff and they tried to get the, the recipe or whatever so yeah first of all bring out the plan work your you know security incident response plan with your security incident response teams and and go from there gavin your thoughts yeah, I mean, Nate, Nate's the, <laughs> that's, that's the playbook, isn't it? Um, instant response. I mean, the, the thing that, the, that I started nodding like a dog when you were sort of talking about the scenario. And, and the reason is like, I've, I've been up close to that exact case. You know, it's, it's a very common way of, you know, we hear about phishing, uh, we hear about identity compromise, but, you know, insider um, supply chain attacks is, you know, fits this case classically. So, um, you know, I've targeted, let's say Nate, you know, he's, he's one of the developers for my app or something. Hey, Nate, you know, I've got some details on you that you don't want to go public. How about you give me access to stuff, right? And the way that's going to work is you're going to give me remote access or give me some something that gives me that access. Um, you know, and then off I go. And then you know, th that instant response note should be the thing that sort of captures what I've been up to. Is that state of exfiltration or I've been moving laterally across the environment, you know, previous escalation. Maybe I've jumped across into like a different environment like the cloud or some other vendor. Um, but yeah, it, it, depending on when you find out about this, like depending on what lights you've got flashing, like some folks, they have the tools, but they're not looking for the flashing lights. So it's, uh, it's, it's as important to have that visibility as it is to have that instant response. Yeah, I, I think the law enforcement partnership is a good call out here by Nate. And that should be also one of those contacts in that incident response playbook. It's not something that we often think about when we're corporate IT to have contacts for local law enforcement, FBI, whatever it is. But in this case, there may be some laws broken and, um, you know, obviously partner with HR and legal on that. But at some point, you know, that may be a call that you have to make, which is, I think, called for in this this scenario. Um, and yeah, your incident response playbook, cutting off access to the employee, um, that should be a pretty quick decision. And looking at all the things that that particular workstation or that employee has accessed, you know, go from there. So yeah, good stuff here. Adam? I think that touches on it. Well, actually relatively straightforward scenario, obviously kind of a weird one that you don't run into too much, but it's possible and probably has happened and, and maybe you guys have run into, but that's the playbook. Um, can I also just say, make sure we flatten that machine and completely pave and reinstall it before we redeploy it um, for more updates and everything before we uh, put that back out there. Sometimes organizations like try to clean these and that gives me the willies like, no, just pave, yeah. pave and reinstall, man. Yeah, I just want to bring up, too, on that, maybe this is an opportunity for education to the employee base. You put that in your security awareness program. Hey, if you do get contacted, we do have this, right? Just let your employees know that, hey, you know, we have all these tools to track and to do everything else. So if you're going to do this, incredibly risky, try to get in front of that. It's not worth the money that you're going to receive. You will be caught. Good. All right. So this next one I've encountered as well. These are all very common situations. So I love talking through all of these here. An employee has taken their device to a local repair shop instead of your help desk. And they've provided credentials for access to that workstation. Now you find out that their computer is at the local repair shop. And uh, how, do you, how do you handle this? Nate, we'll start with you. Okay. I mean, it, there's a lot of, a lot of uh, variables in this one, right? Did they give them the MFA codes for anything? Hopefully you have remote access under MFA, so you're not liable there. But either way, um, definitely, you know, reset passwords is a big one. This is almost another incident response, to be honest with you, just because of the fact that your credentials have been exfiltrated to a, you know, to a third party that you, you know, it's a non-trusted third party. Um, but definitely, you know, work with the user, 
you know, and hey, what, what's the whole scenario to know what do you really need to protect outside of, you know, the easy stuff of resetting all your passwords, go back and do a full forensics analysis on the machine. What did they access? Can you tell what was accessed during that time period? Um, all those items. And then definitely, you know, investigate where it went, you know, have a conversation with the, with the person that worked on the machine. You know, it's, that's definitely uh, an option as well. Gavin? Yeah, I'm, I'm thinking um, if I've given this device to a repair shop and I've given them credentials to sign into that, that, that system, does, does the person have admin credentials? Yes or no? Because if they just fire at Mimicats on that device, like, okay, where have they gone? <laughs> you know, and um, if they had admin pr privileges, then you know, and a VPN connection, you know, we need to, we need to sort of get on top of that pretty quick. So, so, so something that gives us visibility of attack paths and lateral movement paths into sensitive resources, we should be jumping straight to that and finding out like anything got on here. You know, it may be you know fine. It's a it's a perfectly great you know repair shop. No no you know sinister intentions whatsoever. But you, you need to eyeball those uh, those paths and make sure that. Things are good. In any case, I'd be flattening that device anyway. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the way that we configure our devices in general for productivity and usability for users, if they have the credentials to sign into the device, a lot of times our SaaS apps are single sign-on. So you're clicking on, you know, the browser. It may load into the my apps portal or whatever portal you've set up through your IDP, and then you can single sign-on mm -hmm. into them. So Having the credentials to sign into the laptop gives them access to all that. And oh, and by the way, if you don't have separate admin credentials for administrative access and you're giving administrative access to the regular you know, user credentials, then they have admin access all over the place. So a lot of practices that we have harped on, you know, having a separate administrative credential for access, um, also not giving administrative access to your regular user and uh you know mfa i talk about mfa um in the fact like in this case like maybe you have a device vpn tunnel or you have a always on vpn which is also good practice and if that is the case then all of a sudden you sign in and that computer has access to your company's network and so that's that's a, a big thing and um i know a lot of people exclude their company networks or their company ips from mfa and that is not a good zero pra zero trust practice so you know i would urge people to not have that practice if at all possible i understand the use case for users but in this case you're eliminating the one thing that if it's off network uh you know or on network in the case of an always on vpn you're not getting prompted for mfa and then the final thing i'll say is in a uh incident response or EDR situation, the first thing I would do is I would use my tools and network isolate that machine. So I know, you know, MDE, the Microsoft Defender for Endpoint, CrowdStrike, all the vendors in this space have usually that capability to isolate the workstation. And that's probably the first thing for incident response I would do and then go from there. Andy, have you ever had your workstation isolated? <laughs> too soon maybe <laughs> um, uh, <laughs> so what i want to add to this here again i'm, I'm going to take a, a little bit of a different tact on this i am concerned again why our employee took this route and i, I want to help understand why were you not aware of other options or better options to handle this and how can we help educate our whole employee base better going forward that Hey, if this breaks, it's okay. They're all insured. You know, it's, it's normal. These things break. We're going to take care of you. You spilled coffee on it. Stuff happens. Like, just bring it to us. Like, please. Like, that's the important part here. We're, we're less worried about how it got damaged and more worried about that you're productive and that the company is secure than anything else. Like, ultimately, that can all be handled. And, and so I'm concerned about that. I think otherwise, conversation's good. I do want to add one interesting wrinkle here to think about. So with Windows Hello for Business, you can sign in with a PIN. And that might be something if, if I go hand this device to a repair shop and say, oh, yeah, my PIN is blah, 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 blah. And with that scenario, if they sign in with a PIN to Windows Hello for Business, and if they use Azure AD as their identity provider, that satisfies MFA requirements because Windows Hello is considered 
an MFA sign-in because it combines a something you know, the pin, with something you have, the private key stored in the TPM of the device. And so even if you're requiring MFA to go to this site or to sign into VPN, if you have it integrated and to do this thing, that MFA response is now satisfied. You've actually given that repair shop two factors, not just one. And so I do not bring this all up to scare people and say, see, this is why you shouldn't do PIN. PIN is great. PIN is way better than password and MFA. But but these are the scenarios you need to think about where, again, user education, like never, ever tell anybody your PIN ever, and especially not if you're handing them your device. Because I could tell you guys all on this podcast right now, I could tell everybody my PIN, unless you come steal my Surface Book off my desk, it's in, it's not helpful to you. So I'm not, I'm not trying to like... Sh- you know, ring the bell here and scare everybody. But that's something to think about too. Even MFA in this scenario might not have prevented access by the repair shop, depending on how you're configured, how they did it and everything else. And um, again, you know, I, I liked Gavin's point of start with the worst case scenario and work backwards. Like as far as prioritizing your work, look at those lateral movement paths, look at any administrator access they have, go assume the worst right away. This guy got Mimi cats or gal and went to town um, with the help desk credentials that were cached on there and started moving laterally in the environment. Okay. Let's, let's assume they did that and then we'll work backwards and then we'll do the more, you know, day to day stuff like, yeah, let's do a full forensic analysis. Let's change the passwords, do this. Like obviously a lot of these you can run in parallel because they're parallel efforts, but I did like Gavin's call out there that if you start with the worst, you can really cover your bases very quickly. And then you can move down the list on things that are more benign and, um, ultimately less risky, but you do want to dot your I's and cross your T's on. And then, yes, flatten the machine. A- any other thoughts there? there? There was, I was I was thinking through, Adam says something about um, it, the education piece, piece, which is, you know, bang on. I, my mind is going to the anti-patterns. Like when I think about security anti-patterns, it's things like where, you know, we might motivate teams or individuals within the organization to do things that sort of don't um, don't go into that integrated security process or thinking. Um, so one anti-pattern, one anti-pattern might be that maybe the infrastructure team are motivated to go and spin up a new tenant because they don't like the people who currently run their tenant for 0365 or something. Um, an anti-pattern here might be, well, I took my device to the to the local repair shop because my IT department's really slow. Mm-hmm. Oh, it takes ages, and oh, I just want my laptop to work. You know, I don't have an answer for that, but I just think that's you know, these anti patterns which motivate people to do things which go outside where we'd want them to go. You know, maybe we see okay, well, because of the way we're doing this, it's actually opening up a security risk. So again, that sort of goes up to the infrastructure team to sort of join the dots here on on what's going on. I love that call out because anti patterns that Gavin's talking about. A lot of those come up in conversation around passwords. In last week's show that got posted last Sunday night or Monday, uh, one of the things I brought up was in in some of the new cybersecurity regulations that are applying to national security in the United States, as well as the Department of Defense and um, several other government organizations, they finally, finally, finally said – Stop periodic password expiration. Stop password complexity requirements. Things that we've been banging the drum on for a long time here. And anti-patterns in in things like passwords are, and we all kind of know this today, when you set these complexity requirements, humans think like humans. And so they want to make it look like a English sentence. So they want first letter capitalized, rest lowercase. They want a number, then they want a symbol because that is kind of how you know, English is constructed. And so all of these things that are meant theoretically, that if we have more character sets involved and we have more entropy involved in password making, that it leads to better passwords. But humans don't function that way. And it actually was a backfiring mechanism in that it made very predictable passwords where almost everyone with complexity requirements of uppercase, lowercase, number, symbol, constructs their passwords in exactly the same way. And so it wasn't really helpful. It didn't add meaningful security to passwords. It was an anti-pattern to Gavin's point as another example. All right, our last one here. A branch office or or your main office has been broken into and multiple <laughs> workstations were stolen. So a lot of things in this one, um, physical security, device inventory, Gavin, we'll start with you. What are your thoughts on this? My my audio broke down there. Who are you addressing that to? 
Oh yeah, uh, Gavin. I, I what are your thoughts on um, office getting broken into and multiple workstations getting stolen? I I have a little story on offices getting broken into, which I can't for legal reasons go into on this podcast. <laughs> I'm really sorry. <laughs> That's the first time the show seventy something episodes, and it's the first time somebody is invoked. <laughs> Well, I mean, it's a really good. Um, when you say being broken into, I mean, I'm going to, I'm going to imagine that you're going to kind of the guy with a sort of stripy jumper breaking through in the middle of the night, you know. But you know, I, in some dim, distant part of my past, I, I walked straight up to the reception desk without any sort of identification with me and said, "Hello, I'm with IT. I, I'm here to work on the ser- on a domain controller in the server room. Can you let me in, please?" And I was walked straight on through and left alone in the server room. So, you know, you can break in without necessarily having to, like, you know, force a window, right? Um, but, yeah, so in this scenario, they've broken in. They've taken a bunch of bunch of laptops. Um, so, yeah, there's obviously physical security. How do they – how was that achieved? You know, um, what was our – did we have people? Did we have, you know, the de- devices, you know, the, the cameras and so forth to sort of pick that activity up? How, how was this discovered? Um, you know, was only found out when people came to work in the morning and, oh, where, where's everything gone? Um, from an IT perspective, you know, we're going to go straight back to the, the, you know, the legal. Do we have, obviously, law enforcement's probably being called onto the scene already. Um, how do we lock those assets down? Like, were they, um, were they kind of autopilot devices? It's just a case of whipping, whipping them out of the directory. Um, or were they devices with sensitive data on? Like, do we start going and, and, and you know, putting focus on how that data's, been um exposed now um you know what accounts on the devices um earlier on you mentioned like the help desk thing you know how 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 are people signing into these devices is it just using a password or if we got you know nice strong credentials everywhere um yeah and again back to the ir response you know this is uh, a probably uh, probably a pretty clear uh, example of an incident that you need to respond to so <laughs> hopefully that covers it <laughs> Nate, what are your thoughts? You know, it's funny, but this brings up uh, the same thing, right? Many years ago at an organization, we had, and it was in a large office building, and somebody got off the elevator and they just walked through the office and casually picked up a few machines and walked out. And, you know, because we, you know, there's, there's so many different people in these offices, not everybody knows everybody next to them necessarily, and they're spread out. Right, you might have three people gone over here, two people gone over here. They literally just did that. They walked through the office, took them, walked out, and like you know, a bad episode of Cops. It's all grainy video of people's faces. Good luck trying to identify. You know, you wear a baseball cap, walk through, um, couldn't find it. So yeah, it does happen. What's your what's your physical security like? Do you have badge access to different areas? I think that's much more common now than it was even 15 years ago. Um, then you know, number one. What type of data was on these machines? You better verify pretty quickly that, hey, all these machines had encryption on them. If they had encryption on them, you get out of a lot of things, right? You can, that, that helps legalities and a lot of other pieces. Then you go from, you know, get in your instant response like Gavin talked about, lock them down, whatever tools you have, network contain, blow them away. And, um, you know, definitely, again, you know, probably bring in law enforcement after you talk to the lawyers, of course, and whatnot, and see if you can't trace them back previous jobs. I know we've, we found machines at pawn stores. Um, pawn store owners have called us up. Hey, we have one of your computers. You know, they, they can tell by the, you know, serial numbers or another tag you have on there. But definitely a, a real thing that can happen and something the organization that's the number one reason. This is why you encrypt your drives. This is why you encrypt everything. Everything's mobile these days. Your A lot of your security pr- programs should be based on the fact that everything can be stolen easily stolen, whether it's USB drives, laptops, it needs to be f- encrypted. Yeah, that's a great call out. That was the first thing that stuck in my mind as well. <laughs> do you have full disk encryption? Because yeah, if you do, then the risk of everything, all of a sudden, everyone can kind of breathe a little bit easier regardless of what data is on it because it's very hard to crack that and most people aren't you know common thieves are not going to have the capabilities to do that generally so then you're just worried about the user identities you know are you using uh at ad join you know is it a device uh level vpn you know if it is you know when they turn on the computer um 
it will connect to the corporate network automatically. So maybe, you know, if you have a device inventory, um, make sure that uh, you have uh, those devices uh, network isolated, you know, disable a VPN, disable the user even. So those are things that you want to go through as part of the incident response. Um, and uh, yeah, I think, I think th- those are my thoughts. Just, I, I have to add one more fiscal security anecdote. So a company I worked at two stops prior to Microsoft very much prided themselves on being like very, people first kind of model to the point where they didn't issue badges. They didn't have security gates, didn't have you know revolving doors, anything. And it was a pretty decent sized publicly traded company, but it was just not their jam. And, um, you know, same thing. I had been a contractor my first four or five year, five months there. And so when I switched over from being a contractor to being a full-time employee, like five months in, uh, one of my peers says to me, Hey, it's going to be great not having to sign into the front desk every day. And I looked at him blank, like, <laughs> I've been supposed to sign at the front desk every day. <laughs> like, yes, contractors are supposed to sign in every day. I didn't know that. I just walked right in like I own the joint. I mean, that's what I've been doing for five months. So, you know, it, I, I think that's a really almost the more key point here is sure. Can an office get broken into and laptop stolen? Sure. But a lot of this can really happen during the daytime hours. Somebody just kind of walks in and pretends like they belong and, you know, depending on your physical security scenario, uh, there's there's opportunity for sure. And so that's something to think about. And I think the rest of the conversation is really good. The only question I'd kind of just ponder out loud, and I don't have an answer to this, is, you know, what is what are the motivations of the devices being stolen, right? Is it to pawn them? Is it to make some easy money? I mean, if you see like a common break-in in the middle of the night, that's probably more likely this scenario. I think almost the... Um, the like super surreptitious ones during the day, like drive by, just kind of grab it and and walk out. Those might be the ones where you're more concerned about, you know, an actual like nation state attack or somebody who, who's actually going to want to try to break into that device, you know, corporate espionage, whatever the case may be. And, and I guess you have to assume the worst always like, let's assume this is super sophisticated nation state attackers who took our devices like every time, but then you're going to spin up a lot of effort for something where it might've just, they might've just, like you said, sold them out of the back of a truck or pawned them. So I don't know. Yeah. Yeah. I, I think we're overall much better prepared for this scenario today, just because so many systems by default are encrypting, you know, b- back in the day when this happened in my, you know, this organization, the knee jerk react- reaction was, all right, we need laptop locks. Oh, that's great. You know, that's one of those things where you get the, you know, the, the human effort is going to work around it because it's such a pain to lock it, unlock it. You forget the key, you lose the key. All right, well, get out the cable cutters. Um, yeah, it's. I mean, and cable locks only prevent like the most casual theft. Like, <laughs> like at the college library, sure. Like if you're if you're at the college yeah. library and you're going to walk away from your desk, yeah, cable lock. Somebody's going to walk past it, but past that, mm-hmm. like any determined attack, yeah. I mean, we all know that, right? But they are not. Yeah. They are not the the solution here. One thought too on encryption. This is where implementing an additional information protection program with an additional layer of encryption above and beyond your full disk encryption can be valuable, both from a knowing where that data is, because there's a lot of solutions that can help you inventory that and and know like this endpoint did have highly confidential data on it, but don't worry, it's, it's got that second layer of encryption on it Um, versus, you know, not having that visibility. We don't know how sensitive uh, information was stored on that device. So we're not really sure what our, what our risk profile is here. So that that's other things you can do in, in the risk of uh, physical theft to, to help understand like what, what the attack surface is, what you have to be concerned about um, as well. So and another kind of benefit of implementing an information protection program is getting that additional confidence in knowing where your data is and knowing it's protected above and beyond just the FDE. Looks like uh, Gavin lost connection there, so hopefully he's everything came out okay on on his <laughs> ends. That was the end of our um, all of our tabletop scenarios. Hopefully, the folks who are listening in got something out of it. Uh, these are all 
pretty common scenarios that I picked out. I, I like talking through them, and it's always good for information security teams to just do some sort of tabletop exercise like this. It be it six months, a year. I think on a at least a yearly basis would be good to just talk through and and work through your incident response plan to make sure that it is up to date. I just want to thank Nate for taking time out of your day to come on the show. Uh, Gavin as well. I know he dropped off, but thank you to you both for taking time and talking through some of these scenarios. It was really great seeing you guys. No, thank you for the invite. And, and as you mentioned, Andy, these are fairly common, but just because it's common doesn't mean you don't need to be prepared because it's like anything else, chaos scenario, right? Things go bad quickly. You need to be prepared for it. That's our show for this week. Thanks, as always, for listening and watching. Our contact information will be in the show notes if you guys have any questions. Thanks. We'll talk to you guys next week. Thank you for listening to the Blue Security Podcast. Please check out the show notes, catch up on episodes you may have missed, and subscribe so you don't miss any future episodes. Find Andy on Twitter at AJawZero and Adam at AJ Brewer. See you at our next episode.